and if the company is awarded a, uh, a compensation, as it has been in over half of the cases already decided, then that is also paid by the taxpayer. <coughs> this seems to me uh, outrageous because it means also, it's not just the legal part of it, it is that this places a ceiling on regulations which governments may impose. So you have a ceiling on the environment, you have a ceiling on consumer protection, a, a ceiling on health uh, um, warnings and health um, uh, measures to, to protect public health. This is, to me, this is completely outrageous. Not many people know about this yet. And this is one of the things we really must try to popularize. Because this is a takeover of, of one of the most important functions of government that exists. And not to mention privatizing the judicial system. This treaty is not to do, its name is completely false, it's not to do or very little with trade. Because trade transatlantically is already uh, extremely free. The average tariff is under 3%. There are still fields like agriculture and motor vehicles which have higher tariffs, but it's certainly not all of the trade. And this is 40% this is of world GDP we're talking about. This is $2 billion worth of goods every day. This is a big deal. And since the U.S. is negotiating at the same time a trans-Pacific partnership, what they are hoping, what the United States hopes, they hope two things. They hope, first, that everyone will have to become like them. Our regulations should be, well, Britain doesn't have as strict regulations as we do in continental Europe. But what they want is for everybody to have weak regulations. The US system is let the product onto the market, and if there are problems, then you can litigate them. The European system is not perfect, God knows, but it is much more um, precautionary. If, if we don't know whether this product is harmful or not, let's say right now that it is restricted or that it is banned. And this is what they also want to get rid of. Um, the other thing that the US wants is once that treaty goes through in the Pacific, that's 11 countries, I think, and goes through on the Atlantic, then that will be overwhelming and it will become total law for the entire planet. This, this is what they're going for. And this means that people will not have a, a, an opportunity ever to express their consent or not, ever. Um, so, and then I said a little bit about the UN, the Global, the Global Compact, initiated by Kofi Annan, in 2000 with the head of Nestle. Some of us mean-spirited people called him Nescofi um, when he did that. Now there's 7,000 companies in the Global Compact um, and they are given special privileges. And now every agency of the UN has been told to designate uh, one a person who is in charge of relations with the global compact companies. So there's a person at FAO, at the, at the World Health Organization, at UNESCO, etc., etc. They all have to have a representative who has a dialogue uh, with, with the companies. And those are the people who were extremely active in Rio and did indeed form the largest delegation. Um, and uh, finally, uh, I've said something about the the Davos Global Redesign Initiative, which I need to learn more about, but so do we all. Um, and I've sort of come to the end of what I, what I wanted to say, but it's been telegraphic. I'm sorry I haven't been able to tell you more about each one of these, these really nefarious uh, advances. But uh, I think the trans... I'm not saying there's a conspiracy. I just think there is a, there is a huge push towards uh, saying, well, business can do this, and governments can't, and uh, citizens forget it. We have stakeholders. We don't have citizens. We don't have to worry about them. And it's governments. It's not government. So we're completely free. That's an example of framing the discussion. Don't accept their terms. Talk about citizens. Talk about government. Don't accept the way they frame the questions, uh, because we've got a big fight ahead of us. Thank you very much. So, comments, questions?
questions, remarks, criticism? Who would like to ask the second question since the first one is always very difficult? <laughs> I might take the chair's privilege and frame one question to give people time to, uh, to formulate this. Um, actually, my, my head is, is a buzz like a, like a Christmas tree because the various things that you're saying are like lighting up these other things that I've been, uh, that I've been thinking about uh, and in a very unexpected kind of way. You know, with this unruly politics stuff, what we're, what we're looking at is people, again, challenging the legitimacy of the current structure of the state. In recognition of the complicity of the, of, of the state and neoliberal capitalism. Mm -hmm. It's about challenging the, uh, the monopoly over justice. And pulling, the, you know, uh, pulling justice outside of the realm of simply the state. So we're looking at, at general assemblies on the streets. We're looking at all sorts of experiments with direct democracy. Mm -hmm. Uh, spilling outside of the way in which we have imagined politics. Now, that is a challenge to, uh, to, to the formal structure of the state from below. Mm -hmm. right? As compared to, to here, where the corporations are doing precisely the same thing, right? uh, challenging the legitimacy of the yes. state, but, but from, from uh, above in, yeah. in some yeah. sense. Yeah. So in, in some sense, we are, you know, on both sides, there is a challenge to, uh, to that legitimacy. It's a, it, it's about, uh, you know, in, in that kind of context, I, I guess the, the broader, more abstract political question is for people who are fighting for a, a fairer world or for, you know, mm -hmm. a more uh, substantial notion of justice. Um, should our energies be looking at reinvigorating the state or reimagining the state itself? A return to, you know, to, to uh, you know, an attempt to to to, to claim, claim control over over the state and you know uh, uh, give it give it that legitimacy again, or should it be moving in another direction? I think broadly that is a. It's a really tough question. My own, uh, I think that's that's a wonderful way of summing up what's happening in the world. Um, my own view is that. The state at the moment is always on the same turf I was talking about, Europe, US, developed countries that, that came out of the Enlightenment tradition. Um, I don't think the state can be trusted. I think it has been really infiltrated by, by neoliberalism and the so-called socialists in France are, are absolutely nothing to do with socialism. They're totally neoliberal. And most other social democratic parties are the same way. So. Um, I, I can't answer your question. I think both have to happen. Because I think the people from below are also, they recognize this in a, perhaps not in a specific way, the way I'd like to speak about it this evening. But if they recognize that, that things are not under their agency. They, they don't have power over that. And often the governments don't have power over things also. In Europe, we, we sort of sit back and let Germany make a lot of decisions. Um, so let's let's discuss that. I don't have a I don't have a one two three answer to, to that question. It's a, it's a very good way of looking at the at the state in the middle. Yes, please. Uh, I um, I liked your point about studying the the pa the rich and powerful rather than the poor and powerless. But I wanted to. Not necessarily challenge it, but ask if there's a, a, another way. Of, uh, there's still a role for looking at, not just looking at those elites to expose them, but mm -hmm. um, helping people, um, the, helping the more powerless see each other. And that one of the impacts of neoliberalism has been to atomize each other, ourselves from ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a study in the UK this summer about how well do the British people know know themselves, um, uh, how little they know about how they miss. Uh, imagine how many immigrants there are, how many people are claiming benefits and things. And this was done by the Royal Statistical Society and spun as how we're all apparently illiterate in statistics. What's much more interesting really is that we're believing the myths that we're told about ourselves rather than looking at each other and understanding ourselves mm -hmm. and each other. And there's a long history of socialists who've done this, things like the isotype movement and people trying to communicate 
society to each other and the mass and ex mm -hmm. sort of size of society. And also where I see some hope for change is it's sometimes in some of the more horizontal networks and the mm -hmm. ways we see people working online to talk to each other, mm -hmm. networks of solidarity and new networks of solidarity mm -hmm. that there's a lot of history of networks of solidarity but new ones and they're enabled through things online. So mm -hmm. I was wondering if there's still a, would you agree that there's still a space for mm -hmm. knowing ourselves and that that is maybe uh, <coughs> part of, of how we might get out of some of the struggles and, and sort of ways in which we've been stuck? Yes, well, that's, I mean, that's a very good observation. I, I would only caution against one thing, which is, for example, there are some fantastic things, that, interesting things that are happening in Greece. But what a tragedy had to occur for there to be um, soup kitchens, uh, popularly run clinics. Uh, that's, if, if that means that the state had collapsed before those things had to be invented. I would much rather live somewhere where that is taken care of by the state and it's not the citizen's job to educate, to care for, to feed, to house, etc. Uh, everyone. So I would only caution against that, but otherwise I completely agree with, with what you have to say. Well, thank you. Thanks so much for laying bare the practices of the powerful in the Euro-American zone. I was wondering if you could share some thoughts about what's going on beyond that zone. I mean, one of the things that's mm. happened between, between your millennial work and, mm. and this, uh, accelerated by the 2008 crisis, of course, the rise of, what do you call them, the BRICS, the rising powers, mm -hmm. emerging markets, whatever, but the fact that there are other players um, remaking the hegemonic structures. And the question is, in, in what image? Right? So have you, through Attack or TNI or any of your other engagements, been talking to um, thinkers and activists in those countries mm -hmm. about what, what is the shape of the remade world order? Is it simply neoliberalism with a broader ruling elite? Uh, or are we looking at other, um, other models, other challenges coming to the fore from China, from Brazil, from India, from other rising countries? Is that something that's been part of, of the conversations you've been engaged with? These things are always ambiguous because sometimes they go forward and sometimes they go backwards and sometimes they win and sometimes they don't. So uh, it's always hard to say what's going to be the outcome of all of this. But what our, um, our friends in Latin America have to say is that there have been permanent and, and quite positive changes. And it's not perfect, not, you know, nobody's perfect, but, but they, are, you know, they are much better off than they than they were um, 20 years ago. Um, this comes to us from one Venezuelan, from, um, oh, I'm only thinking of the fellows now, a Brazilian, two Brazilians actually. Um, we don't have anyone from the smaller countries, but we hear from them and sometimes they come to meetings. Um, and, and this is extremely positive. What has happened in the Arab world is extremely positive, despite the fact that you know there's a lot of confusion what about civil society and the military in Egypt? You know, Tunisia goes back and forth between uh, very tough um, laws against uh, the, these these people who have been extremely courageous. But I think, on the whole, what is encouraging to me is that that I feel like a child of the Enlightenment. I think the, what happened in the 18th century and then the gradual. Uh, increasing and enlarging of all of those rights uh, has been an extremely important development in human history. Maybe the best thing that ever happened in human history, despite the fact that Europe is responsible for the two bloodiest wars, for colonization, for the, the Shoah, for, I mean, you know, you all know the, the horrible list. So, uh, and I'm very happy to see that other people want exactly the same things. And they, Take from, they come from a different tradition, and yet these, are, to me, are universals. So, um, of course, I applaud anything that happens anywhere where that can be made more concrete, where that can be made a form of government, and, and, and where the people are clearly not as anesthetized as Europeans are right now, because, unfortunately, the revolts, if you like, in quotes that we have in Europe are mostly to the profit of the right wing. And mostly, 
uh, of people who are suffering, who are uh, feeling co totally neglected, uh, misunderstood, living on very little uh, materially, and who think my vote doesn't count for anything. I voted for the right, I voted for the left, now I'm going to vote for the National Front. And this is the Social Democrats are also making them a boulevard to, 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 um, to do that. I mean, Beppe Grillo in, in Italy is a, Grillo is a very, um, that's a very ambiguous thing. We already had the, uh, we already had the Lega del Norte, we already had the Northern League. Uh, and these are always anti-immigrant, they're always anti, you know, any values that I think all of us would share. So, very ambiguous. This is going to go on forever, probably. I mean, uh, and what's happening now, though, I mean, my conclusion could have been, but I sort of was racing, is that um, there is a class in Europe which has never accepted the transformation after the Second World War, has never accepted the uh, gains of working people since then, retirement, um, pensions, holidays, paid holidays, um, overtime, pay, all of these things that, that have been won by, by struggle. And now they are saying, as far as I can see, we're going to get our own back. This should, as, as the Secretary of the Treasury under Herbert Hoover said, this was Andrew Mellon, who was famous for his libraries and his charity, um, who said, in times of crisis, assets return to their rightful owners, meaning me, <laughs> Andrew Mellon. Uh, and, and then he said, you have to liquidate the farmers, you have to liquidate everything, because then you get your own back. The class that should be in charge becomes the, once more the ruling class. And I think that's, that's still true. So nothing is ever forever. And they're using, Naomi Klein described this very well, they're using this moment of frustration, of, fur, of fear, of all kinds of dep deprivation, uh, to, to claw this back. They'd already, since the 70s, capital in Europe was already getting, um, instead of 30% where it was, at, was in, in Europe, 30% of the of economic value generated every, every year and 70% left for salaries and wages. Uh, they're now up to 40 or 45, depending on the country. And that means more than a trillion a point, well, a 1.3 trillion that's removed from the, from the pockets of labor every year because they've taken more than 10% of the GDP of, of Europe and they've had the same sort of progress in the United States. So that, that too shows that they're winning. And, 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 but that's not enough. <coughs> that's not enough for them. So. Yes, David. Maybe take the last question. Yeah, um, David Jones. I'm on the board of Red Pepper and also Brighton Green Party parliamentary candidate in Kemptown. Um, I just wanted to make two points. Really, one the first one was that there's a, a study which was done two years ago, which I'm always surprised that no one else seems to have heard of. It was done in New Scientist magazine, and it was originally carried out by a bunch of mathematicians scientists who were interested in network theory yes and the they looked at, yes and they looked at the 43 43,000 largest corporations in the world yeah. and what they found was that in, in reality those 43,000 corporations were run by the boards of 147 yeah. companies uh, all of whom in themselves had interlocking directorships and members members of the board so in effect 147 corporations yeah. run the 43,000 40% of, of world yeah. GDP is controlled by 147 companies who have, which have overlapping membership of boards, which is quite extraordinary. I mean, it does reinforce one's conspiracy theories, actually. Um, but, it, you know, it's, I think it's, it's worth saying. Just on the other point of how you finished about the dangers of this, I mean, the problem is that the more we reveal about what, what is happening amongst those rulers, it, the danger is it, it, it actually induces a degree of powerlessness. People feel... What's the point then? 
you know, and it does come back to your point that, that you know, socialism or barbarism is the real choice, and frankly, barbarism is winning at the moment. You know, and, and we could go the other way because an awful lot of people feel at the moment yes. that there is just no point. So I might as well just enjoy myself now in the interim uh, and not bother too much about you know trying to change the world because it's just so difficult, just so hard to change things when there's such an immense concentration of power, wealth, and influence, mm -hmm. and. And from that point of view, I think you're absolutely right to point to the rise of the far right in different parts of, of Europe and elsewhere. And here we have UKIP, which is a potential proto-far far right type of party. Um, and I think it's incredibly important that they are challenged and that we take the territory which they try to occupy and challenge that territory. Because otherwise, that, that appeals to people who feel utterly powerless. Uh, and of course, what we have to do in the case of, say, for example, the UKIP thing, is, is to identify and make clear to people that UKIP, contrary to being the party of a little, the little people, it actually was revealed two weeks ago. It's bankrupt, bankrupt. It's bankrolled now by the fourth largest, richest person in, in England, who has a fortune of 600 million pounds, who's paying for their entire European election campaign. Uh, and that if we can, who is if, that? I can't remember his name. It begins with the letter R, but I can't remember his name. But he's he's now bankrolling their entire election campaign. And we have to sort of demystify that these sort of people who present themselves as alternatives, standing up for ordinary people against the powerful, are actually the outriders for the powerful mm -hmm. and are controlled. It's another front. It, it, it's right. another sort of astroturfing organisation, right. if, if you like, in that sense. So. Um, so I think conspiracy has got a role <laughs> in this, um, but also we have to find ways to make people feel that this power can be confronted. And certainly, I, I feel—I mean, I, I'm quite old now. You know, I, I feel like in my lifetime, I can never remember so many institutions of the powerful being so discredited. Yes. You know, that, I've never had so many people discredited. really so so disliked. You know, yeah. people talk about the media, the church, politicians. Yeah. They're all, at, you know, they're seen as utterly corrupt. I can never remember it being that widespread before, ever. Uh, and that's a, that's a stuff. There's one question. Well, I, I would just like to make one comment about that. In, when you talk about the article called The Network of Global Corporate Control, I read it. I can't do any math, really. You can all read it. Just skip all the equations. Yeah. But go to the annex, because in the annex, which the piece in The New Scientist does not talk about, it cuts down those 140 companies to only 50. These are the most interlocked companies in the world. And they are so interlocked that they <coughs> represent a particular danger because as the, as the scientists, these are complexity theory people at Zurich Polytechnic. And as they say, if the economy is going well, that's fine. But in came times of stress, one of those companies fails, and the whole dominoes pack just go to and falls. Those 50 companies, I looked at them all, and except for two, they are all banks, hedge funds, or other financial services companies. And we have not disciplined those people who are still running things, and that is what might keep me awake at night if I decided that something ought to keep me awake because they can ruin us again, and that would be, I mean, that time it would be really for everybody. So, um, well, let me give you an example of hopefulness. In France last week, a group I've been associated with since it was founded, called Roosevelt 2012, uh, brought together a certain number of people who have been thinking about these problems, but none of whom are politicians. And uh, some of them decided, and I decided to join them, to have a new political party which would present candidates for the European elections. It is called, it, it's called New Deal in French, which is Nouvelle Dame. And the first day after it was announced, 20,000 people asked to be members of this party because it's citizens, it's not professional politicians. And they, I think you're right, they have a general feeling that the institutions are corrupt. I don't like to say they're all rotten because I know politicians who are perfectly honest, etc. And it's very dangerous to say it's all rotten and only the far right is you know, holding up the banner. So, so that's a sign of hopefulness. Another sign of hopefulness is something called the Alter Summit, which is extremely embryonic for the moment. But when we saw that there were 
all kinds of things happening in Spain, in Greece, in Portugal. Uh, nobody was listening in Brussels. They could bring out a million people and who cared, you know. We thought unless we can bring together um, movements as Europeans, we're not going to get anywhere. So this Alter Summit has now brought together 200 organizations, trade unions, social movements, uh, ecologists, feminists, um, a whole economists, a whole variety of people who are saying we're going to work together. One of the main campaigns this year will be the, this transatlantic treaty because that concerns every European. So that's a good thing to take on. And it's a, we have a huge job of popular education to do, you know, I mean, but once people are given some sort of tree that they might cling to in the storm, you know, I mean, I think they're, they're disgusted, I think they are often depressed, and, 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 and do exactly what you say. They decide, I can't do anything, so I will, it's like the time of plague when they used to go out in the public squares and eat and drink because <coughs> they knew the next day who was going to f fall from the plague. Um, and that's the kind of period we're, we're in. But I, I try never to, maybe tonight I was too pessimistic, I don't know, but I do try to, to show that there are ways of doing things. On this campus, you have people who are doing things right now. This is, maybe you will say this is not a huge example, but what's the transnational that's going to take over your catering? Sodexo, or I don't know, but you should find out about Sodexo, or whatever the, 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 the catering enterprise is. What have they done elsewhere? What are the prices like? You know, we're always told that privatization is going to be better quality, more efficient, cheaper, da da da. It's all wrong. It never is, especially for the price. Of course, they have to include profit in their price. Of course, it can't be less expensive, or they're only serving junk. So, I mean, I would think that would be a good project to look into that. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Um, strategies of resistance uh, interest me. Um, and uh, I just wanted to say, um, 15 years ago, I set up a course in the centre of Brighton at the Friends Centre. And um, we called it How the Animal Love Dies. And really? it was your book as the inspiration. And uh, several lecturers from IDS came and talked and other activists as well. So um, I'd like to propose maybe one strategy would be uh, IDS colleagues could uh, assist in that process again so that we can move the ideas forward. Um, but what I, the other thing I was going to say was that um, uh, there's some similarity in your analysis to that of Colin Crouch in his book on um, strange non-death of neurons. Which I have to say I'm not read yet. No, I think your approach is more radical than but nevertheless, he has some interesting ideas there, just towards the end. I think he's a bit liberal in his approach. But um, in the end, he says, well, if the corporation is going to actually start to be a policy actor, then we need to problematize the corporation. And what I was thinking while you were talking is, maybe we need to put the corporation much more in the spotlight. So instead of protesting against cutbacks to the government or to the university for that matter, to directly go to the corporations and be protesting outside them and treating them as if they are the policy actor that they implicitly want to be, let's make it explicit and take our demonstrations directly to the doors of Coca-Cola. Rather than them being nice right. organizations that sponsor the Olympics and all this stuff, no, let's, let's treat them. They are doing the cutbacks. They are, they are the ones who are, are our target, in a sense. And to embarrass the politicians as well. I think that's a very good strategy. And the other thing I would suggest, and completely in line with that, is that the investors now are demanding returns of 10, 12, sometimes 15 percent. The gains of capital, <coughs> are, they, we're always hearing workers are too expensive. Work, we have to cut wages. Huh? Well, why is that? That's because the corporations are paying dividends to their shareholders. Nobody ever says capital is too expensive. But that's where a lot of the money is going, because they're paying dividends to their shareholders. And the only slogan for business now is shareholder value. 
used to be the business is to be responsible in the community, etc., etc. No so that's a very good point. There's one question there. Um, <coughs> my question is, um, great books from your earlier days, some of which we're looking at the UN. And Could you speak up a little longer? I look at this from some of your earlier writing. You look on occasions at the, U, at the UN organization. Yeah, not very much. But and I was just wondering, in the context of today, could you say something about the role of UN organizations and their relationship to the power holders sorry, that, you, <laughs> that you see now emerging in the corporate sector? Well, I mentioned that a little bit in the Global Compact, which is 7,000 companies which can wave the UN banner. They are members of, of this. So would you call that collusion? It's called the Global, the Global Compact. It was founded by Kofi Annan in the year 2000. Uh, with the head of Nestle, <coughs> the plan was we will include business. All they have to do to get into it is sign a charter of 15 principles on human rights, labor rights, and, and the environment. Nobody monitors them. If they don't report for a couple of years, I think they get thrown out, but others come in just by signing these principles. And then they get to use the UN logo, or something very like the UN logo. And, and then they, they make deals between themselves, and that's how the World Business Council for Sustainable Development has grown more powerful. Um, they, you know, I mean, businesses meet each other all the time. They meet at Davos, they meet at the American ones, meet at the Bohemian Grove, the European ones with the Americans meet at Bilderberg, you know, I mean, the top people in business, they know each other. I call them the Davos class because for the sociologists here, I think they are a genuine social class. They're itinerant, they are nomadic, they are international, but they are a social class. They educate their kids in the same sorts of schools, they belong to the same clubs, they have houses in London and Paris and whatnot, you know, in New York maybe. I mean, it's just, it, they operate in the same way. I think it's a social class. And, uh, that's the that's the locus of of transnational power today. I mean, I, of course, they're running companies, banks, and so on. But and they're quite interchangeable. If the if the banker is thrown out or dies, he'll be replaced by somebody else who will be invited to Davos next year. You know, he may be a total unknown, but he will be Davos next year. Well, mine is more of a general comment than a question itself, and it's related to what he was uh, commenting about the fact that maybe we should actually address the corporations and be being there. I would say that this is already happening, but uh, the problem is that uh, the big organizations, research institutions, and the ones who actually have more possibilities to actually spread the word uh, by publishing words or whatever, they are not really, they are not really um, using that kind of strategy. Rather, in a lot of occasions, corporations are actually the partners. So I think that it would be important to do a little bit of an exercise of, of honesty in a moment like this, when we are keeping things coming together, one after other, the situation on campus and so on, and to do this exercise of honesty, especially now in this institution, that a lot of people is actually involved in. In, yes, in the universities, and they have the power to make this kind of struggle uh, a little bit, at least push it step forward, mm -hmm. because this is already happening. So we are already doing things. One of the proposals of this new political party, no well done, is, is that municipalities and, and regional and national governments should not do business on public works, on public procurement, with any bank or corporation that has subsidiaries in a tax haven. That's one sort of concrete proposal mm -hmm. that you can apply, mm -hmm. because that's the sort of thing you can find out about if you're the government. So, I mean, that sort of strategy, I think putting the corporations in positions of responsibility where they have to reply to certain criteria. You know, they, they, have, they have got, in the, in the period when people's salaries are being cut and so on in France, and their retirement benefits are being reduced, etc., etc. You all know that. It's the same story here. The government has given 20 billion 
wait a minute, yeah, Brown, Brown, yeah, 20 billion euros to the top stock market listed companies in a, what's called a, a tax credit for growth and employment. You know, those are the excuses that are always used. But there's no kind of 20 billion euros to improve the health service. You know, I mean, it's, and and you're, you're absolutely right. Everybody who's saying, let's spotlight those people, yes, yes, let's, wherever we can. Name and shame, it's called. Too. Well, first of all, thank you for the, for the talk. I really find it very interesting. You um, have to speak up a little oh, more, sorry. too, please. Well, thank you for the talk. I, I think you. it was very interesting. Um, I really like the, 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 con the, the notion when you spoke about the fact that neoliberalism was very good at realizing how it's important to understand uh, minds of people rather than trying to oppress them mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, Culturally, how to culture. Be, be common sense, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think uh, it, it quite links to what the lady on my right hand side said about how we do not know ourselves enough. Uh, I think the, the, these corporations, are, are, they, the key is that they know ourselves sometimes even more than we do ourselves. They, I think they know very well what makes us tick. Uh, because I come from a psychology background, so psychology says it. I'm quite interested in this area. And I, I think for me at least this area of uh, of this almost like a warfare, so uh, the psychological warfare is actually happening, is what I found interesting because um, whether it's via media, whether it's via all these, as you said, writing of the questions, and uh, I found it one of the most powerful ways how neoliberalism is maintaining uh, and they are maintaining their power and essentially leaving people disempowered. Well, uh, you should share your findings. Uh, I haven't done any studies, of course, but I, I think it's. <coughs> Uh, you know, to be honest, I can see it in everyday life. Like I'm a, I'm a second year psychology student, uh, but you know, I already have a lot of friends who, after finishing their degrees, uh, after getting all that knowledge that we have about how how we work, they want to go to advertising. And when I ask them why you want to go to advertising, they tell me because that's where the, all the money is. Of course. So I think the question is how to break the cycle because the young people have to, who even in psychology, actually are ending up in organizations strengthening the way it's working even more. Uh, well, let me make something very clear. I have had a privileged life in which I have not depended on the university. I was introduced as a professor. I talk in different places, but I've never been part of a university structure. I can say what I please, and that is because uh, my material base is secure. It's not enormous, but it is secure. And I don't encourage anybody to get into a situation where they are going to be burnt out because they do not have a material base. So I'm not going to criticize individuals, whatever, whatever job choice they make. And I think there are things we can do outside of our jobs also. Uh, and particularly for women, uh, I think it's, it's important to make sure that you are not going to be uh, left high and dry because you were um, involved in some sort of activity. I don't encourage that sort of thing, but I think we can all be committed. And life is very long now, particularly life is very long for women. You cannot do, when you're having small children, you know, you can't do this, this, I'm addressing this to a man, but you're surrounded by women, so. Uh, <laughs> you can't do the same sorts of things that you can do if you are free of that sort of duty or if you no longer have to make a living or whatever. Uh, so, so mm -hmm. I don't try, I, and I think that's something that the far left, at least in France, I'm sorry I have to speak about the country I know the most, but. The, f the left front, which I supported in the previous presidential elections, I think that they are, they really are just criticizing the people who are going to vote for the national front too much. I don't think we should criticize them. I think we should understand that these are people who are suffering, who have genuine complaints, and who maybe are not particularly politically conscious, probably not at all, and cannot see beyond 
the threat of the, of the immigrant or the <coughs> you know, that's close at hand. But it is, uh, it's, um, the problem of engagement is something you have some time for when you're students, not a lot perhaps, but some time, and which you also will have at different times of your life. And the people I like best, and I will tell you all that I'm an old lady now because I don't look it, but I'm 79, and the people that I like are the ones who have gone from being moderately or, you know, moderate or conservative, but who have become more left throughout their lives. And the ones, the, the trajectory that is the most usual is to start out as a radical and go more and more and more to the right. And that is not the start. So to guard against that with, your, with every strength in your body, because that's, that's bad news. You become very conventional and very boring. <laughs> I find it quite interesting what you just said about women and activism, um, because in my opinion, for example, the fracking debate, which is a Sussex, um, kind of in the Sussex area, if you have pictures, photographs of women with children, it's a family affair, and it's, it's said that actually the family does care. And if a woman and child attend, um, say, a rally or something that comes up against mm -hmm. the corporations... You're talking it, about shale gas? Then? Yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, it does, pictures. Yeah, it shows that, um, in my opinion, it shows that it belongs to the family, it belongs to society, yep. it stands for society. So I am a single parent and I do wonder whether I should take my daughter along to these things, whether I should endanger myself uh, to be arrested by the police. And, but when I have conversations with my daughter, she says, yes, that's the right thing to do um, and she would like to go along. What do I do? Do I make the decision for her or do I attend or not? Do you find out if you're likely to be attacked with tear gas? Yeah. <laughs> you um, find that out first and if the answer is probably not, yeah. you go. And if she yeah. wants to go with you, she goes. That's the crux of the argument though, isn't it? Whether you can actually have power um, yeah. through what well, Yes, movement. yes, it is. Um, but that's what I mean about you can do different things at different ages. Yeah. I do not go to demonstrations yeah. so it's going to be probable that I have to run. Yeah. I mean, that's not a very good idea. So, so I mean, it's just it's sort of common sense. But I, I just want to stress that there are any number of ways in which you can contribute. Intellectually, you've got the ammunition for that uh, by putting your body on the line, as we used to say in the 60s, by, uh, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of ways. But I think intellectuals in particular, students, have a particular role to play. And yes, that's why I come to university as opposed to doing that, but it's an interesting <coughs> thing to think about. Well, but you have your own strengths. Yeah. That's the basis of democracy. Look, everybody in this room knows things I don't know. Mm -hmm. well, maybe I know a few things that, that you don't. But, but bringing together these, these, this knowledge and, and these various experiences, that is how one can create democracy. And you have, everybody here has things to contribute, everybody. That's what democracy is about. So I have to ask my minders if I'm, should I stop now, when should I stop? Um, <laughs> <laughs> like five minutes and then we'll have Five minutes, well I think a lot of people want to leave anyway and want to probably go to a meal. So unless there's a burning question, we can have a last burning question. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to ask about strategies for empowering, so to empower ourselves. Um, do you think it is turning to like a smaller scale is a good strategy? Maybe turning into a small? To, like to thinking on a smaller scale? Yes. In some, because like in, in some areas, because for example, like we have a student food cooperative on campus that means students buy um, the organic food for mm -hmm. cheaper prices, not in the supermarket, mm -hmm. but in the stand. In, in the market here, and not just like raising awareness and protesting, but also maybe with cutting the profit of transnational corporations because you organize alternatives, also economic alternatives. Like, could you say some words about that? Well, you? sure. I mean, but there was a period in Britain, I forget the name of the organization, but there was a student organization that was fighting for that. That's why you have canteens or, or um, shops that have fair trade food. Because students before you uh, went out and said, "This is, you know, we want this," 
and it did, it, it did spread in Britain, quite, and it was quite effective. So, yes, of course, I think that sort of thing is key. I mean, there are different levels, there are different scopes. There. I talk internationally because I've had, you know, the luck to, and that's sort of what interested me, but that doesn't mean everybody has to be at the same sort of, have the same approach or have the same, um, I don't know, well, you see what I mean. Yeah, because yeah. when we think in terms of participation, of like the small scale is Of course. And also, I would caution against trying to do things alone, because that is almost a certain recipe for failure. But with a few friends, you make, a, you make the core of a group, and then you can enlarge from there. But you don't, don't try to do it alone. Try to you know, find allies first. Look for your natural allies first. So, I think it remains for me to thank you, to thank everybody here, and to say you know, good luck in the future, and I hope that... I've always wanted to come to the IDS and to Sussex, and I've never been here before, so... Uh, you've had some wonderful publications and some very important people thinking here, and I'm sure this is a tradition which is being followed every day in this institute, so thanks very much for having me.